We welcome you this morning. Thank you for joining us, although not physically, but in spirit as we gather together. Welcome to Marlow Baptist Church. We trust that you are safe and that you are trusting in the Lord in these very difficult and challenging times. Wherever you might be this morning and to our fellowship as a whole, we just thank you for, for the fact that you are with us this morning as we gather to worship the Lord and to hear his word preached. I take a reading this morning from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. I say, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Let us bow our heads together and let us pray. O Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne of grace this morning, we do so with burdened hearts. We approach you, Lord, with sorrow and grief at what is happening in our world. We rejoice in you as the creator of heaven and earth. We rejoice in your salvation that you've given to us. But, Lord, we do approach you being very aware of what is happening in our world and the suffering that many are going through, many families are going through, not just physically, but also those who are in isolation that feel very alone and afraid and cut off from the rest of the world. And we pray, Lord, this morning for our world, and we pray that you will envelop many with your love and with your care. And as we approach you as your people this morning, we do so just being thankful for who you are, that we know that despite the circumstances of our world, that we can trust you because you are the creator, you are God, you are the one who is in control. And we approach you this morning, humbling ourselves before you, being thankful for the salvation that you've given to us. We are very aware of our sin, and therefore it is a blessing for us to be able to approach you, despite our shortcoming, despite the fact that we should not be able to approach you, but we can, in and through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and the work that was done on the cross. We approach you, Lord, this morning, praying for our world and praying that in the midst of this tragedy and uncertainty, that you will speak to the hearts and minds of men, of women, of boys and girls, and that they will truly sense your peace, that they will call upon you as the creator of heaven and earth, that they will turn to you in the midst of these difficulties. We know, Lord, that there will be many that will use this as an opportunity to blaspheme and turn away from you. But we pray, Lord, and we know that there are many who will turn to you. And we pray that as the Christian church worldwide, that we will be able to respond and truly be used of you as hands and feet and eyes and ears of the body of Christ in the midst of this crisis. We pray for those within our fellowship and we pray that you'll be with them. We pray that you'll draw close to us as a fellowship. We think specifically this morning of Keith Ingram, we pray that you'll be with him, be with Marion as well. We also pray for Reza and Anna and Harold and the family at this time. We pray that you'll be with them. We pray for those within our fellowship who might be struggling, who might be feeling alone. We pray that you'll be with them, knowing that as a fellowship we, we, we are drawn together by contact via phone. But Lord, we know that it's still difficult. We pray for Patrick and Joy at this time as well. Please be with them, Lord, and may they sense your peace and presence. We also pray for our town, 
And we pray for everyone here in Marla and also the surrounding areas. And we pray that as we are here as a church, we know that yes, the building might be closed, but the church is not closed because we are the church. We are your hands and feet in this world. And we pray that we will be salt and light in this world. So we pray that you'll be with us in this town, that we will be able to live out the gospel in this town and truly live for you and be a testimony to the wonderful, amazing grace that we have found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please be with us, Lord, as we pray for this world. We don't have answers. We know that you are the answer, but we just pray that you will help us to, to not be despondent and be in despair, but look toward you as our hope as our sure and certain foundation in these difficult times. We just pray that you'll be with us, Lord. And as we have the privilege of hearing your word this morning, we trust that we will be blessed and inspired. So please be with us. Be with every part of our time together. Everything said and done may truly just bring you honor and glory. In your wonderful name we pray. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now listen to a song together. It's a beautiful song. It's a song that is entitled, His Mercy is More.
We continue this morning with our series entitled The Glory of the Cross. And it's been an encouragement to us to consider God's Word as we look at the cross and the glory of it, but also in how that impacts our lives every single day. I've entitled the message this morning, The Fullness of the Cross. And the reading is taken from the book of Romans chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 1 to 11. Of Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1 to 11. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we are still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We are truly in the midst of a great struggle, and there is a sense of insecurity in our world. And there are so many things that we can be uncertain of. When we see people generally being very concerned about everything that's happening in the world, and just that real sense of panic, almost, and uncertainty about what's going to happen tomorrow, and what might be the next announcement. So we see that. And it's not just for the world out there and for those who don't know Christ. It's for you and for me. If we say that we are not concerned, I'm not sure if we're 100% honest with ourselves. Even as Christians, all of us are concerned about what is happening in the world. And there's this feeling of uncertainty, even amongst us as God's people. The great difference between us and the world is the fact that our faith is in a living Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who conquered life and death. Therefore, when we are uncertain and we're concerned about what's happening in the world, we know that we can trust Christ because he came, he lived, he died, he rose again, and in him we can put our faith and trust. As we have considered this series on the glory of the cross The focal point in our Christian faith is the cross of Christ. It is the glory of the cross that needs to be proclaimed. It's the glory of the cross that is there as a sign and symbol of God's amazing grace. But I want to speak to us here and now this morning. And not speak of the glory of the cross in its proclamation. But I want to speak to us this morning of the fullness of the cross. The fullness of the cross that is so important to us right now in our lives. It's the fullness of the cross that brings security to our hearts and to our lives. That security that we all need in a time and in a season where there is so much insecurity. It is the truth of God's word that is so important. It's the truth of God's word that brings security. And as we consider the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and what was done on the cross, it truly brings security to us in these times. Jesus said that heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will not. And it's therein that we can place our trust 
in the word of God and in the fullness of the cross of Christ. I believe that this passage is very important. It's difficult time-wise for us to consider so much more, but as we read chapter 4 leading into chapter 5, it is so important and so vital to understand the fullness of the cross and what truly happened on the cross and what Jesus accomplished for us. Now this morning it might seem a bit theoretical or even doctrinal really in a time where we should be talking about our struggles and concerns. But I believe that this passage deals with our struggles and with our concern. A greater understanding of what Christ has done will truly bring a sense of peace and security to our hearts as we just sit back and truly take in the fullness of the cross of Christ. And therefore, this passage is so important, in including chapter 4 as well. So as we look at this chapter, I want to focus on three areas. The first is the complete work. And we see that in verse 1 and 2 of the passage. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It's so interesting as we read chapter 4 leading into chapter 5, that chapter 4 deals with Abraham and Abraham's faith in God. And because he believed God, that was counted for him as righteousness. That all those who come after Abraham who also believe God are in the same position as him to receive grace and receive forgiveness and receive righteousness because of that faith. So that's what chapter 4 deals with. And then we see in verse 1, which is important, it says, Therefore, so because of what's been said in chapter 4, that through Abraham's faith and our faith in Christ, we receive a righteousness and justification. That's why the word therefore is used, because he's saying, Paul is saying, because of what's been said in 4, now let's look at that a bit deeper, which is so beautiful. So that's why he uses the term therefore. Now the cross is more than just a symbol. It has become a symbol because people wear a cross around their neck. We see crosses outside of churches. Um, we see the whole dynamic of what the cross is, and it becomes a symbol. But the cross is so much more than just a symbol. It is about what was accomplished on the cross. And therefore, what brings us security is not just seeing the cross. It is because of what God's word declares about the cross, about what happened on the cross, about what was accomplished for you and for me on the cross. Without the cross, we don't have salvation. Without the work of God that was accomplished on the cross, Salvation would not be possible. So in the midst of this world and this absolute turmoil, we know that as Christians, we don't just look at the physical. We look at something far greater than the physical because that which is seen is temporary, but that which is unseen, that's eternal. But how can we embrace the eternal? The only way we can is through the fact that we have salvation because of what Christ has done for us. So the cross is far more than just a symbol of something. Something was accomplished for us on the cross. And chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 gives us the picture of what was accomplished. Leading from 4 into 5. And what we see is the word justified. And it's an important term. It really is. So as Paul writes, having been justified by faith. And justified is so vital within the picture of the cross. The word justified in the original language basically means to be declared righteous in the sight of God. So to be declared righteous, to be innocent before God. But I think it's very clear for us this morning that we know that we are not innocent. That you and I are sinners, we fall short, not just in what we do, but who we are. Therefore, how can this passage say to us that we are justified, that we are suddenly righteous, suddenly we are innocent, suddenly we are perfect. It's because of what Christ has done and because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Suddenly something has happened. We have been declared righteous. Faith in the finished and complete work of Christ declares us righteous. And this is what gives us security. This is the fullness of the cross, a complete work. The Christian message is not half measures. It's not the fact that Jesus started a work and I have to work part of that through. That I have to be a good person to be able to accomplish further parts to that work. The Christian gospel and the Christian message and the truth of God's word is that the cross is a complete work. That is the fullness of it. The cross makes it possible for you and I to stand before a holy God. As we see in our world that life is finite. Life is, as James says, but a vapor. It is here today, gone tomorrow. But yet we have God who is the creator, the eternal one, the one that is above all, that has created all things. And for us to try and comprehend the, the idea of being able to stand before a holy God, a God that is perfect, yet we stand before him and we're not. And therefore the passage is clear that because of what Christ has done and the power of the cross and the glory of the cross and the fullness of the cross, we can stand before God as righteous and as innocent. And the cross makes that possible. And this links back to security. Because in a world that is very insecure at the moment, in a world that is very uncertain, there's one thing that you and I, as those in Christ, can have security about and can be secure in the fact that we can stand before God in and through the work of Christ. That before we go to bed at night, as we wake up in the morning, that we can truly look up to heaven and know that we can be in the presence of a holy God because of what He has done. There are many in our world today that will be very concerned about death because they don't know what lies ahead. They don't know if they'll be able to stand before the judge of the universe, if they even believe that, but they know that there's something. As Christians, we have assurance and security that no matter what happens, we can stand before the Holy God and not look at Him as our judge, but as our Savior, as our God, as the one who's extended grace to us. And because of that, we can now have peace. Oh, and how people long for peace. Many of us would just want to be at home and have a sense of peace in the midst of this turmoil, in the midst of what we are facing in our world. How many would love peace? And the passage says to us, because of what Christ has done, because we are justified, because we, be, we have faith in what Christ has done, because of that belief, because of our faith in Christ and His finished and complete work, we are justified. And because we are justified, we can now have peace. This is not a, just a myth or something we, we share with one another to make us feel better. This is what the scriptures declare. The fact that in Christ we are righteous, we are holy, we are set apart, we are now innocent in Him. Therefore, we can have peace. We are forgiven. And God is for us and not against us. And that's the fullness of what was accomplished when Jesus Christ said those words, it is finished. The work is complete. So we see a complete work in verse 1 and 2. It's also interesting in verse 2 that we have access. That through whom also we have access. And the whole term access and the dynamic of access is to be able to come before a holy God. As you see behind me, there is a curtain in our church. And it's often a reminder of what would have happened in the Old Testament in the temple. There would have been a curtain between the Holy of Holies and the rest of the temple that only the high priest could go behind. He only had access. Because of what Christ has done and because of what happened on the cross, the curtain was torn in two and all of us have access to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this should bring security to us in the midst of whatever we are facing. But the passage then moves on 
And this is why it's so pertinent for us this morning to consider this passage. Because it's not just the fact that a work was done, a complete work. But because of that work, there is something magnificent for us. Something wonderful. Something beyond our comprehension. Because the work is not just a once-off complete work. It is also a continuing work in our lives. And therefore, verse 3 to 5, which are beautiful passages. And often we quote those. But I don't believe we always quote them in context with verse 1 and 2. But verse 3 to 5 says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So because we have been justified, because we have access to God, and because we have peace with God, that gives something to us, security and also the assurance that despite trials, despite tribulation, we can glory. We can glory in the midst of them. Why? Because of the work of Christ. Because of the fullness of the cross. Suddenly now, when we face tribulation, we can glory in tribulation. And the term glory there is the term confidence. That we can have confidence in tribulation. Why? Because we know that the trials we go through, the tribulations we face, it's not condemnation from God. It's not punishment from God for us who are in Christ. Why? Because we've already been justified. We have peace with God. Therefore, whatever we face now is not God pouring out His anger and His wrath upon us. So we don't have to look up saying, why God are you punishing me? Because it's not punishment. We can have confidence that whatever happens, happens because we are part of the human race. But God is doing something in the midst of that because it's a continued work. He's continuing His work in us. The cross is continuing in its work. We can glory in tribulation because our trials are not condemnation, but God working in us. And the passage is clear that what happens is that God is starting to produce something in us as Christians. That he's producing what? Patience. He's producing character in us. So that we know that whatever happens to us, it's part of God's greater plan to produce something in you and in me. God is in control of the whole process of tribulations in our lives, of trials. And therefore we can look up and know that our Heavenly Father is with us in the midst of that because he's producing something in us. And maybe as you are listening now and just at home, let us think of what God might want to produce in us. Because we are not the finished article, so to speak. There's work that needs to be done in us. And in the midst of this trial, we can glory and have confidence in the fact that God is still at work in our lives. So we see that the cross is a continuing work. And in that fact, we have security because it's a once-off work, but also the fact that we can know that the cross is so magnificent in our lives that God is still producing something through that truth. And that is giving us security in that continued work. It's such an encouragement also to us that it's not about sin. Often we, we feel that when we go through difficult times, it must be because of some hidden sin in our lives or some issue. But that's not what it's always about. Yes, there might be consequences sometimes when we sin. But if we face tribulation and we look up to Christ, it is because He's at work. And we can embrace whatever comes our way because we know that it will be for our benefit. It will be to produce something in us. And the confidence we can have is in the midst of whatever is happening in our world, that the one who created life, the one who still creates life, the preserver of life, the author of life, is the one that we know, the one that we have peace with, the one that has justified us. Therefore, whatever happens to us physically is in his hands because he is the giver of life. And nothing happens without him being part of that. 
And therefore, we can have confidence in that. Therefore, we can trust that. Therefore, we can believe in Him. That no matter what happens, our lives are in Him. Even in the midst of tribulation. And then it's so beautiful because it says, yes, we can glory in tribulation because it produces patience and it produces character. But then it leads us to something so beautiful. It gives hope. That we can have hope, not just in this world, but beyond this world. And there's that statement, it's so beautiful. The best is yet to come. It's a statement that uh, my, my senior minister, who, who helped me so much, used to say, and something I really held on to was, the best is yet to come. And as Christians, we know that no matter what we face, that the best for us is yet to come, because the work of Christ and the fullness of the cross is a continuing work unto that time where we are in Christ's presence. I want to make this statement. I want you to think about this this morning. Trials are not tests to see if we are worthy. That's not what trials are for. But trials are working in us to produce character that glorifies God. So I'll say that again. Trials are not tests to see if we are worthy. So God's not testing us to see if we are worthy of salvation. That's not what trials are for because the work's already been done. But trials are there because it's working in us to produce character that ultimately will be part of God's glory. So the more that we grow, the more that we mature, the more that we trust in God, the more it produces character in us that ultimately will bring God greater glory. So whatever happens in our lives ultimately is for the honor and the glory of God. And then we continue with the final thought, not just the complete work and the continuing work, but also the consolation work. And we see that in verse 6 to 11. And I just want to read that again and, and just focus our minds on that. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God to the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. The cross and the fullness of the cross is a consolation work. It consoles us in so many ways because we are weak and fragile. And I'm not just speaking about us as humanity. Yes, as humanity we are weak and fragile. It takes one or two things. We've seen that in our world. It takes one or two things and our world is completely turned upside down. But you and I, even as Christians, we are fragile. And life has so many difficult challenges. And those challenges often make us feel even weaker as people. As we can echo those words of, of Paul the Apostle where he even says the things he wants to do that he doesn't do and the things he hates that he seems to do. And often there are things and pressures in life that draw us to the fact that sometimes we do things we don't even want to do because we just feel weak. We don't feel strong enough. But the cross is so magnificent because there is a fullness to that work that despite the fact that we feel weak, despite the fact that we are weak, despite the fact that we are sinners, despite the fact that we're going to say things we shouldn't say, despite the fact that we're going to do things we shouldn't do, despite the fact that we might lose faith often in the bigger picture, God's love is enduring and the work of the cross is there. It's a complete work. Because we can suffer doubt. It happens. All of us doubt. 
John the Baptist doubted. If, if, if there are maybe some very, very special Christians who say you're not allowed to doubt. Well, John the Baptist doubted. And Jesus Christ said there's none greater than John the Baptist. So I'm not 100% sure where those who never doubt fit into that bracket. But John the Baptist doubted when he was in prison. And he sent his disciples to go and speak to Jesus and ask if he is the Messiah. Or if they should wait for another. He doubted. Because this shouldn't happen. And sometimes we can suffer doubt. And often we doubt because we don't trust God's provision in that doubt. We sometimes think, is God going to come through for us? Is God still in control? And it's very much a picture of Genesis chapter 3 because Adam and Eve doubted in God's provision. And from that doubt, it birthed sin. And often that happens in our lives. We doubt the fact that God is in control. And because we become insecure, because we become fearful, often that births sin. And that makes it very difficult for us. But what brings security? What brings security and consolation in doubt and even in failure? There is consolation. And I want us to step back and, and think about this. That the passage is saying that while we're yet sinners, but not just sinners. In verse 6 it says we're without strength. Now what does that mean without strength? That basically means we're not capable of saving ourselves. We are completely lost. Because that's what salvation is. We can't save ourselves. So in the time when we were completely lost, we couldn't save ourselves. There was nothing good in us. In a time we were still sinners and without Christ in this world... God demonstrated his love toward us, that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So at our worst, or if I can get a bit more personal, at your worst, at my worst, at our worst, Christ died for us. When we were enemies of God, not interested, blaspheming daily, not concerned about him at all, Christ died for us. And through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we were enemies, when we were lost, when we were completely drowned in sin, at that time, God demonstrated his love toward us and died for us. And that's important because that might seem like a gospel presentation. Yes, it is, but it is relevant now because now we might feel in the midst of this difficult time we are going through in our world that where is God for us? And has he left us because we might have said something or done something we shouldn't have? But what I can assure you of is the now. In the midst of this now. Now that we are reconciled. Now that we are justified. Now that we are in Jesus Christ. How much more will he not do for us? Far greater things. If he was willing to die for us at our worst. How much more will he not give us all things now when we are in him? So that should bring comfort to us at this time and consolation that the cross is a complete work. We can find our consolation in that. And the fact that because Christ died, no matter what state we might be in, because of our faith and trust in him, God is there with us because in our worst he loved us so much that he gave his life for us at our worst. What a consolation for us that now that we are in him, he is there for us. And that the cross is there continually for us, saving us continually daily. It's a work that is past, it is a work that is present, and it's a continuing work future. For you and for me. And that brings security to our hearts. That the God of this world, the creator of heaven and earth, the one that is sovereign is the one who died for us. And all things that are, that are in his control, we are in him. And therefore nothing is out of control. That whatever is happening, God is in control. No matter what we might face. And that's the fullness of the cross. That when Jesus died... He accomplished something very, very specific. And that is to bring peace between us and God, to bring us close, to give us access to God, to make us His. 
And if we are his now and he demonstrated love toward us then, how much more is he not there for us in the midst of this trial? And it is absolutely amazing for us this morning. So as you are hearing and as we conclude, in the cross we can find security and people are looking for security. And yes, people might not want to listen, and often as Christians we become very philosophical of how we need to share the message and what we need to say. But the reality is that our only focal point and our only place where we can really go to is the Word of God. That is our anchor. So we share what the Word of God declares to people, and we need to then take it on board for ourselves that we are in Christ, and because we are in Christ, we are set apart because we are set apart it's because of a work that was done in christ on the cross and that should give us hope that when we look at the world and we see what's happening around us that the creator our god our savior is there with us in the midst of this because of the fullness of the cross and that the cross has broken down every barrier between us and god that we are not strangers We are not enemies. We are God's children. And if he did not spare his only son but offered him up for us, how much more will he not give us all things and do what is right? So as we look at the cross, we see it's not just a symbol. It's not just a picture of something. It is truly a work that was accomplished for us. And we can live with that confidence and that security in the midst of what's happening, that God is for us. And if God is for us, there's nothing in this world that can ever be against us. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace. And we can approach your throne of grace because there is peace in your presence. Peace because of what you have done for us. You've made peace with us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we we feel insecure. And this, this passage is so important to give us security, to show us that the cross is not just a picture to us and now we have to strive and work hard to try and, and, and validate that or to try and, and, and give honor to that. But it is because of a work that is done for us, a complete work, past, present, and future. May we trust you, Lord, at this time. And may we just hold on to you. You are our hope. You are the anchor for our soul. Please just give us comfort and strength and help us to share with others the hope we have in a finished and complete work that was done for us. I pray for each and every person that is listening this morning and those who are watching. And we just pray that you'll bring us comfort in this time. We are all struggling, all of us. We don't like seeing people suffer and our world suffering, Lord. We don't want to see that. And we pray that you will help us to be salt and light in the midst of what we see. Just give us strength, Lord, to carry on with this wonderful message, to carry on with the hope that is in Christ but also to know that you're producing something in us and that character will ultimately be for your honor and glory. As we thank you for our wonderful time together and the privilege we had to hear your word this morning. In your wonderful name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We also this morning just want to say the Lord's Prayer together and Let's bow our heads together as we just say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We conclude with the final song that is a great encouragement to us.
and it speaks of living 